Good morning and welcome to our service on this the fourth Sunday of Easter and the theme of our service today is that of the Good Shepherd. As you know I like visual aids. Uh, I don't have any sheep uh, or shepherds but we do have uh, the family sheepdog, our pup Patch, uh, who will have to uh, stand in for the purposes of our visual aid. We begin our worship uh, with the Easter greeting as we are still in the Easter season. Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! Our service is a service of the Word and uh, you will find the order on the parish website at cs-nl.org. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with eagerness through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning, Christ is our cornerstone, hymn number 327 in the church hymnal. Christ is our keep silence for a moment as we call to mind the ways in which we have fallen short of God's will for our lives. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbours and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That sacrifice, a proclamation of God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And we say the canticle, Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the collect for today. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, raise us who trust in him from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that we may seek those things which are above, where he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts 4. 
beginning at verse 5 to 12. The next day their rulers, elders and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Anas the high priest, Cepheus, John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man had been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was re rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord.
epistle reading is from 1 John chapter 3, reading verses 16 to 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and see a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit that he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading is taken from John chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. I am the Good Shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. A story is told of a university course in ornithology, the study of birds, and this course had the reputation of being the most difficult class in the whole curriculum. And to make things worse, the professor was an extremely awkward character. Everybody dreaded him because he was awkward for awkward's sake. And he hadn't an ounce of mercy or flexibility. He was aloof, impossible to really get to know. But it was a statutory course and every student had to take it. And as the course began, the professor announced there would be a test in 40 days and it would comprise a lar large proportion of the marks. So you had to do well on that test. Everyone studied. They took copious notes. They made sure they understood everything that the professor said as best they could. And on the 40th day, the students filed into the lecture hall with sweaty palms, extremely nervous, and on the stage was a table with five cages on it. Each cage had a cover, and beneath the cover they could just see the feet and spindly legs of a bird. At the sound of the bell, the professor addressed the students. Here's the test. You can see that there are five birds, and they're all covered, except for their feet and legs. You must tell me the identity of each of these five birds by looking only at their feet and legs. Everyone had studied long and hard, but no one had anticipated such a test. And they were all trying to remember something, anything that could possibly help them pass the test. And finally, one student had had enough, and he stood up and said, This is ridiculous. This is the craziest test I've ever seen, and you are the worst professor in this whole college. I quit. I'm out of here. I'm not going to take this test. And so he turned, and he walked towards the door. Just a minute, young man, said the professor. Who are you? I demand your name right now. And the young man stopped and took a long look at the professor and then rolled up his trouser legs and said, You tell me. That professor, apart from being a thoroughly unpleasant individual, was the very opposite 
of the gospel description of the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. He certainly did not know his students, and they could not get to know him as he never let down his guard with them. And he always related with them on an adversarial basis. But the Good Shepherd is a very different figure. In biblical times, the relationship of the shepherd to his flock was a very close one. They lived together, morning, noon and night, and it was the shepherd who protected the vulnerable and the easily led sheep from ruthless predators. All sheep may look the same to us, but the shepherd would know each of them apart from the other and might even give them individual names. The image of the Good Shepherd is similar and is in keeping with other descriptions of God's intimate relationship to humanity in Scripture. In Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Luke 12.7, Indeed, the very hairs of your own head are all numbered. In some cases, it's easier to count the hairs in our head. Or Psalm 39, 1-4, O oh Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. How do you feel about that? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Does it make you feel uncomfortable that someone, even if it's God, knows you better than you know yourself, knows the deepest secrets of your heart. A strange question, you might say, but look at the world in which we find ourselves and all the con controversy that has developed around issues of confidentiality and the sharing of information, that infamous word GDPR. Ironically, in a time when we share more and more about the most intimate details of our life on social media and other platforms, the issue of privacy has seldom, if ever, been as much in the headlines. It's safe to say that we human beings are complicated and conflicted, full of contradictions. We really don't know what we want, and it might even be said that we do not know ourselves. On the one hand, we want to promote our identity in a culture which feeds off celebrity, and on the other, we want to protect our identity from becoming public property. And in such a confused world, we can be, and often are, our own worst enemies. A bit like sheep who by nature are not very good on their own and need leadership and protection. Not always to protect them from outside predators, although that is the case sometimes, but also from themselves. It's not unusual for sheep to literally fall off the side of a mountain. And in a famous case in Turkey in 2005, 1,500 sheep followed each other over the same cliff and 400 of them died. We need the Good Shepherd, but to accept his love and protection, we have to let go of a couple of things. And the first thing is our unfailing confidence in our own ability. We really are not self-sufficient. If anything, this past year has driven that point home. We are utterly dependent on something outside of us, on a God who created us in pure love, and following from that realization, and secondly, we have to put our trust utterly in the same God who ministers to us as the Good Shepherd, who in that supreme act of self-sacrifice died for us on the cross and in rising lifted us up with him. And that, to do that is not easy. I'm not making light of it. I struggle with it on a daily basis. I'm a proud person. I'm very conscious that I can become wrapped up in myself, and there are times I find it hard to trust utterly and completely, and so my preaching is directed to myself as much as to anyone else. The Good Shepherd is as relevant today as he was 2,000 years ago, but more than any other period in history, the implications of embracing that figure are countercultural because the message we preach is very much now from the margins. It is the minority report. And in a world where the majority is almost always deemed to be right, we have a lot of work to do. So how do we sell it? How do we convince a world that is skeptical, skeptical of its need of anything or anybody that God has something to offer? I think we do it by modeling it ourselves, by being a community that 
our life and worship is centered on the reality of our need of God and of our own limitations. And that in itself, while a challenge to embrace, can become a source of relief and joy as we finally accept and indeed welcome the fact that the buck does not stop with us, but with God. But I can already anticipate the next question. What does that look like? In short, I would suggest more being and less doing. More being and less doing. If we are to be led, then we have to listen and to discern. Just before the pandemic, I had introduced an initiative called Vision 2020 in the parish. Well, if ever there was proof that my vision is less than perfect, what subsequently happened is it. Who could have thought uh, that all our plans would effectively come to nothing? It was all about planning for our future uh, as a parish. And while there was a period of listening and prayer before we embarked on defining the specifics of the vision, it was perhaps not long enough. Now, ironically, we have been given over a year to reflect and pray on what has been and what might be. It has been a gift, albeit one we did not welcome. There is work to do, but there is also prayer and listening to do, so that we might take the right road and follow our Good Shepherd where he seeks to lead us. As we prepare to emerge from this period of withdrawal and captivity, and please God that will be soon, as we prepare for that, let us not in our urge to do things again forget about the necessity of reflection and prayer. More being and less doing. Amen. And so we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now sing the hymn, number 644 in the church hymnal, Faithful Shepherd Feed Me. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now our intercessions. Let us pray. Holy God, your son remained with his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection teaching them to love all people as friends and neighbours. We too are his disciples, and we offer our prayers on behalf of the church, the world in which we live, and all those with whom we share it. Loving God, the letter of John reminds us that if anyone has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need, but yet refuses to help, how can the love of God be in that person? Help us as a parish to aspire to love with action and truth and not merely with words or speech. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for all world leaders that using Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, as the ultimate model of leadership, they would lead and care for their own flocks in such a way that peace might abound, righteousness flourish, and injustice might be eradicated. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, help us to reach out to strangers in our midst. As we remember the way the early church lived in one heart and mind, and shared everything they had, may we too, be always mindful of the needs of those who are less fortunate. And may we always welcome the newcomer joyfully into our midst. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our shepherd, give to the church a new vision and a new charity, new wisdom and fresh understanding, the revival of brightness and the renewal of unity. Grant to all whom you have called to positions of leadership in this and every land, strength, wisdom, and integrity, that they may feed the people committed to their charge and lead them beside the waters of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for those who do not know your peace, and for those who are struggling with their lives. We ask for your healing on those who are sick, and we especially pray for Mary and Francis and Willie. In a moment of quiet, we remember before God those known to us who are in any kind of trouble. May your strength be with those who are tired, and your love be with those who live with despair and fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for your love and compassion to abound as we walk through this challenging time of COVID-19. We ask for wisdom for those who bear the responsibility of making decisions with widespread consequences. We pray for those who are suffering and for all who are caring for them. We ask for protection for the elderly and vulnerable. We pray for misinformation to be controlled, that fear may take no hold in hearts and minds. As we exercise the good sense that in your mercy provide, may we also approach each day in faith and peace trusting in the truth of your goodness towards us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all families who mourn the deaths of loved ones, especially those in our parishes. Today, we pray for the relatives of Richard McKeown, who died recently. Gracious God, we pray for those who now walk in the valley of the shadow of death. We know from the psalm that you are with them and have gone before them to prepare a table overflowing with good things. Guide those who are left behind in the paths of righteousness 
and uphold them in their sorrow with the assurance of your goodness and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, whose way is perfect, help us always to trust in your goodness, to walk in the way of faith, and to follow in the path of simplicity. Teach us to cast our cares on your providence, that we may possess a quiet mind and a contented spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the whole family of your church. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the parishes of Home Patrick, Balbriggan and Kenure, and the clergy Anthony Kelly and Tom O'Brien. We pray for the parish of Hoth and the rector Kevin Brew. And we pray for Trinity College Dublin and the Dean of Residence, Steve Brunn. May all your people be built up in faith and show in their lives the love we see in Jesus. Help us to play our part in the life of the church by our prayers for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, we ask that you bless our parishes with vision for the future and reverence for the past. Guide us each day as we minister to one another and to the world. Help us each day to bear witness to your name and to do your bidding, always mindful of your amazing love for us. We all join in. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We join together in the words of the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us all evermore. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Our final hymn, one of my favourites, and I know a lot of you uh, enjoy this hymn as well. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Number 647 in the Church of Ireland hymnal, sung by Robin Mark. <laughs>